to welcome you to the third of our Institute Encounters for the 2014-2015 academic year. Today we have a very distinguished guest indeed, Dr. Bruce Cole, who among his many accomplishments uh, is a former Bush administration chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, he served from 2001 to 2009, longest serving chairman, I believe, uh, in the history of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, he is currently a senior fellow at the Center of Ethics and Public Policy, uh, and uh, all those uh, attainments capped a long and distinguished career as an art historian with a specialty in Italian Renaissance art most of which was spent at um, Indiana University. So, welcome, Bruce. Thanks, Steve. Um, and I think uh, one of the interesting things that um, uh, those who are watching would, would, would like to know about uh, is what it's like to run a, a major uh, humanities agency. The National Endowment for the Humanities uh, has as its charge the support of, of humanistic scholarship and research throughout the United States. Uh, it's very closely linked to American higher education, to our, our universities, so it does other things as well. Um, and you came to it uh, having had a long career, essentially, as a, as a, as a scholar. Um, uh, you were a great success there, but, but what challenges did you, did you face, and, and how did you make yourself a success uh, at an agency that um, is often in the public spotlight and often is the recipient of brickbats of various kinds? Uh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, I should say that I had a long association with, with the endowment before I became chairman because I had been a panelist and before that I had been awarded an NEH grant. So when I came in I was pretty familiar. And then I was on the National Council for Humanities, which is the 26th member advisory board to the endowment. So I had a lot of experience, but still. Um, it was a big adjustment from being a professor at, at a university. So the endowment really is about scholarship and the support of scholarship. But it's also, and a lot of people in the academy are just a little bit familiar with this, it's also about the support of media, there's a division of public programs, which does films, there's an education division, there's a preservation and access division, which preserves and then gives access to historical records, and there's a challenge grant program, which gives challenge grants for bricks and mortar and the like. And so it's, it's the, yeah, I think the dominant impression, if you were probably on a campus, is that it really is about the support of the fellowships and summer institutes and the like, but really it's a lot more than that. And those are the kind of things that I had really learned. So, you know, there are sort of a couple of constituencies that I had to deal with. One was uh, the, the catchment for, of applicants, which was large, I mean, NIH got lots of applicants. Also, I should say about half the applicants when I was there were for the fellowships. And then, there was also the internal running of the agency. There's about 170 staff, and about six or seven of those were political appointees, and all the rest were sort of career bureaucrats. And then there was also the political aspect of it, which was working with Congress, because the president proposes a budget, and then Congress either accept that budget or they don't. So there's a lot of work uh, on the Hill trying to you know, justify our programs and talk about their worth and the like. So those are about the, th those are the three parts of the, of the job. Um, what I try to do was have a couple of initiatives. And I came in just shortly after 9-11 and one of the things I really emphasized was uh, the need for Americans to know their history, to have better history teaching, uh, to have, uh, and, and, and to make that uh, goal 
you know, as wide as possible. So we instituted a number of programs. And I should say traditionally the, uh, the endowment does that. Uh, a lot of the endowment money before I came in was for the, for the teaching of American history, scholarship on American history, films on American history and the like. But we launched an initiative called We the People, which was actually announced in the Rose Garden. President Bush announced it. And he asked for $100 million for this initiative. And we actually got around $90 million, which was new money. And with that, we... Almost doubled the uh, endowment's budget. Yeah, but it was over a number of years. So oh, we, just, okay. we didn't get it all, all at mm -hmm. once. And yeah, because the budget when I was there, I think at the end was around 100, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit south of 150 million dollars. So we launched this initiative, and it was had many parts. Uh, it, it was throughout the endowment, so we sponsored films on uh, American history. We um, had a number of seminars and institutes on American history, and a number of other projects. And I thought that was really something we should do because there's no question that. You know, Americans really have lost their uh, understanding of their history. There are all sorts of metrics and tests that show this. And uh, this is especially true after 9-11 when everybody was wondering, you know, who are we are and the like, which I think we still do. But uh, you know, to give Americans help, give Americans some uh, compass to the future by looking at, at the past and also to help citizens define what their rights and responsibilities are. And you know, you can't defend your principles unless you can define them. And so that was the that was the general I think effort initiative that we ran. And one part of it called Picture in America was I think the biggest success where we decided we would uh, send a series of very large, very high quality pictures of America to art mainly all masterpieces, to schools and public libraries, to teach American history in a way that you can through the text. Now, when you, when you read a text, it's one thing, but when you look at a picture, it's something else. It's a different kind of comprehension. And, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, the old cliche, which is some truth to that. And I thought, well, this will be a success if we can get this in 500 schools, K through 12 schools, and, and public libraries. In the end, we got it to 80,000 schools and public libraries, including Department of Defense schools and, and the like. So that's, I think, um, I think that was certainly our most widespread and successful uh, initiative. And they're, they're out there, those, those sets of pictures. There was a very good teacher's manual and uh, also extensive website. And another thing, that I initiated there was the digital humanities, and that is um, you know, using scholarship and access and also dissemination through the web. Because I came in 2001, that the web was still, you know, compared to what we think about it now, it's adolescence anyway. Mm -hmm. And so we office, we have often an office, office of digital humanities. Uh, we did things like work with Library of Congress and digitize American newspapers, which is a terrific resource for anybody. You know, uh, news, you know, it's history, news mm -hmm. before it comes to history and digitized documents and, and the like. So that effort is still, is still ongoing. What, let, me, let, let me ask you, I mean, you, you, were, you had some experience with the NEH, uh, and of course, uh, you know, as Woodrow Wilson famously remarked when he ran for governor, Jersey, you ran to get out of politics. Universities have plenty of politics within them. You were experienced with that. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I mean, there must have been a lot of pitfalls uh, that you had to avoid and uh, that chairman of the, uh, of the endowments can stumble into. Uh, what, uh, what, what, what are the leading pitfalls in a, in a job like this? Well, let me say, you know, my experience with university politics and my experience in Washington is the fights are much more bitter. In much in, in universities uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is there's almost nothing to lose. And so if you, I was the chairman of the department, I mean, everybody got tenure. Um, there are very little 
incentives and salaries because everybody got the same paltry amount of raise. And so there's no bottom line. So you could fight away uh, as, as, as much as you wanted. I mean, in Washington, I found that there's much more of a sense of a bottom line that people had to try to work, work together. And then you would have to work with these people. Um, you know, uh, they have no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I enjoy that whole political aspect of it a lot. I mean, that was one of the most interesting parts of the job. But, um, you know, the endowment has been in trouble. Well, I just will be frank and say, the, the, you know, the, the endowment usually gets into trouble. The humanities endowment usually gets in trouble because, in this historically, because the arts endowment, National Endowment for the Arts, gets into trouble. And we used to always say, you know, that the NEH is only as good as the NEA's last grab. <laughs> and, and why does the arts and damage get into trouble so frequently? Well, because, well, they they have not been in trouble for a while, I should say. I mean, the big. Uh, well, I mean, they're they're just a uh, in, in in some parts, and uh, you know, of, of this country, and. In, in Congress, and I understand this. You know, there's a reluctance um, to uh, spend taxpayers' money on, say, individual artist programs, uh, or even on, on humanities programs. I mean, it's just this is a debate that you have with um, public television and uh, you know and radio. I mean, some people will say, "Well, I don't watch this," or "I don't go." To Museums, why not watch the government take even a small amount of my money for that? Um, so they they got into trouble because um, there were a number of exhibitions that uh, really uh, people said were you know, not proper, salacious, and the like. And that sort of energized all this feeling. And uh, they weathered it. I mean, one chairman had to go. Uh, but, uh, so, the endowment itself is pretty much, the humanities endowment pretty much stayed out of trouble. I mean, there, in the last four or five years, there have been some pretty withering criticism about uh, former chairman, not me. But, um, so, one of the things was to really stay out of trouble. And, and you had to um, think about what you were awarding. I mean, we, you know, when I came in, I said, look, we, we want to award grants on the basis of their quality and how impactful they are. And we don't care what the methodology is or what the subject is, as long as it's not trivial. Mm -hmm. And so what we had to do is you know, use that basis, sort of sort out who we wanted to award. Because the award rate is very small. I mean, it's uh, you know, just a very small fraction of all the applications. Are awarded, and then you want to make sure that you know even if they were um, relatively good grants, that um, you know they would uh, you know not get the endowment in trouble. These are some things that. Well, what are the warning signs that the grant might get? Well, the advocacy is one sign. Uh -huh. and what is we there a lot of that. Yes, mm -hmm. there's a lot of advocacy. Grants. I mean, we wouldn't award a, award a grant that took an advocacy position. And there is, in the legislation, it says, you know, basically that there will be uh, no awards to uh, grants that have an agenda or have advocacy, or grants that are just slanted, that you know, aren't balanced and the like. And this was true when we were awarding money for, for films or for preservation projects and, and the like. So those are the kind of things that can get you into trouble. The other thing that gets you into trouble, I think, and something that the endowment should fund, is that just grants that have no consequence are are are, are, are you know completely uh, trivial. And there are a lot of those that, that can. I mean, what's happening, you know, in the academic world? So we talk about fellowships. Is the humanities? We can talk about humanities if you want. The humanities scholarship is becoming, well, not becoming, it has become divided into smaller and smaller subsets, uh, spe highly specialized work. And 
we thought that well, we encourage specialization and we encourage knowledge. I mean, one of the things that I liked to find was the comprehensive Aramaic lexicon, because there was real value, but it was very diving, very it's esoteric, very, yeah. very, very, very diving. We used to say, "Well, mm -hmm. that's probably the language that Jesus spoke." Mm -hmm. So, and, and I, you know, knowledge for knowledge itself, as long mm -hmm. as it's not trivial, it's not really studying. So this, you know, that that would be then a resource that scholars can yeah, use exactly. Exactly. But so that knowledge for knowledge sake and important knowledge I think is important. But um, you know, some of these um, grants just were had no consequence, they were trivial. And we wouldn't award award those. And then there were some that were radioactive that took this advocacy program programs. So I have to say that without getting into names, what, what kinds of grants might those be? Proposals. Well, let me just say first that when I was there, we awarded about eight hundred million dollars worth of grants, and we had almost no problem because we had this you this philosophy. Filter them out. Yeah, mm -hmm. but we had this philosophy that we don't care. We don't have any litmus test about what mm -hmm. you're going to study. How you're going to do it, but it has to be something that's serious and and, and consequential and balanced and the like. Uh, but how, do, how, do, how does a grant coming out of, say, a university uh, have an advocacy aspect to it? But uh, what are the, um, the warning signs that tell you this is advocacy more than scholarship? Well, it's an unbalanced approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take a controversial project, and we had a lot of them that controversial project, but it, 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 it had to be judicious, and it had to have several viewpoints. And, it, and if it didn't, then it was kind of just propaganda. Mm -hmm. So we would be very careful to do that. Yeah, so we, we really didn't have, we didn't really have any problems, I have to say. And also, there, there are grants that, um, you know, might uh, arouse, you know, and I think probably justly, some ire in the general public or in, in Congress, when people think, why, why, why are you doing this? And they usually wind up in uh, um, Senator Coburn's waste book. Uh -huh. In fact, the NEH made a couple, I think they got two in the latest waste book, where it would be very hard to justify some of these these grants as being important or consequential. You mentioned the Aramaic um, yeah. uh, it's a compendium. It's, it's, a, a, it's a, yeah, cover it. Comprehensive Aramaic, uh, it's a dictionary. Dictionary. As a, apart from that, what are the other things, uh, specific projects that, that you're proudest of? Uh, well, the We the People generally, and the uh, American Chronicle, which was this enormous effort to uh, digitize early newspapers. I don't know where they are now, but the goal was to digitize uh, American newspapers in every language. And to make those available to the public. How many were finally digitized? I don't know where they are now, but it's still millions, the millions and millions of uh, pages. And that will be one of the groups. Sort of back through the 19th and 18th yeah, centuries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The 18th centuries, we, did, we didn't start in the, we started, I think, in the late 19th century, maybe middle of the 19th century. The problem at that time was it was hard to digitize some of the fonts of the uh, 18th, 18th century. But it was terrific. So if you wanted to say, figure out how Lincoln did, you know, in the 1860 election, in some county mm -hmm. in Ohio, uh, instead of having to go to the archives of this of a newspaper or some you know, courthouse or something, with you know one click of a mouse, you could find this out. And what it did, it 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 it, it digitized the actual newspaper. So you were actually looking at the newspaper, then you could see everything along the way. Mm -hmm. You could see the ads, you mm -hmm. could see, um, you know, as you were going along, you found all sorts right. of, uh, of interesting. So that, that digitization program, I think, was, that was the big one. And all the standard reference works, um, like the comprehensive uh, uh, Aramaic uh, lexicon, there were another project with a very deep dive in, into, into knowledge. The other thing I was very proud of was the support for the presidential papers. 
And that, that actually was a big issue because, uh, no, I, I may be wrong on this. I think the Franklin, well, that's not president, but that's early. Um, I don't think any of the, uh, for, say, first four presidents, any kind of founding president, mm -hmm. uh, have been fully digitized. And what, what the traditional support for this was for print editions. And so he had these very great editors basically spent a part of their lives, or a good part of their lives, editing these papers. And then they would come out in, in print volumes. Well, that was fine until uh, digitization came mm -hmm. along. And then we thought, well, why should uh, these things, first of all, there should be all sorts of retrospective digitization. So you digitize what's there. I don't think there's anything in that history more important mm -hmm. than digitizing these, these for the presidential paper. Mm -hmm. And then we wanted to also do prospective digitization, where they would put up what they were working on, uh, the editors, and uh, they could do, you could do the actual text, and they could do a, a, a kind of ca ca a capsule description of it, and then you'd have everybody working on it. And that's the power of the web. Mm -hmm. It's like Wikipedia. And we interviewed, uh, we had a magazine I interviewed, Every month or every other month, I interview some leading line in the humanities or uh, some someone associated with the humanities. And I interviewed uh, Jimbo Wales, who's the father of Wikipedia. And I said, "Well, how many people do you have working in Wikipedia in your office?" He said, "Well, I think three. Mm -hmm. And so what this is uh, kind of you know, crowdsourcing, and you know, there's somebody in the world, and not necessarily. An academic. You know, who knows, for instance, you know, some more about Manassas One than anyone in the world because they're obsessed mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. it. Just like Wikipedia has mm -hmm. people who are obsessed mm -hmm. with semicolons, mm -hmm. you know, who, they, right. <laughs> who, who, who they use. And so what you have is this vast you know, pool of knowledge that you could work on. You know, this idea is a wiki of any. Sort of open source. Um, so how does that work with presidential papers? What do people do? Well, we we, we were unsuccessful, mm -hmm. first of all, because we were unsuccessful in getting. I don't know where it is now, but in the retrospective digitization, and because you know these editors, and I can understand some some of it. Uh, they're trained in another tradition. And it's, we tried to encourage digitization all across the endowment, but it wasn't. It was a kind of failure. So you wanted these historians to kind of throw their working process open yeah. to a large uh, audience of, of other specialists out there, and uh, maybe kind of uh, gifted amateurs, who would in some way contribute to the editing of the papers. Right, it's just like Wikipedia. Commentary on the papers. Yeah, but, but it would be more, it would be better. <laughs> Wikipedia is very... With, with, with the chief guy still in charge, though, in terms of filtering what, yeah, what yeah, is and what not. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, the editors would still right. be in charge, but, I mean, they could put a page of, of say, some Washington presidential paper on the web, and then um, you don't know what that would lead to. I mean, there are people, oh, I've got another letter here, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and the like. So it's a, you know, continually evolving form. I mean, you'd have to have some... I wasn't too worried about how that would work. I was really worried about trying to get the principle of the thing. And... But it is a very interesting... Because there are a lot of academics who use the web, obviously. But when I left, we had a number of incentives on this. For instance, we had this one program, I don't remember its name, uh, which gave money to tool building. Because listen, the, the, one of the interesting things about the web is there's just enormous amounts of material. And you know, you get the whole world's knowledge eventually mm -hmm. in, in your iPhone. It's pretty much there. And um, but there aren't tools to retrieve it. And so we had this program to build tools, and we for the first time in the announcement said, in this particular these were search engines of various search stuff? engines mm -hmm. yeah search engines and technology mm -hmm. that would be specifically built to capture mm -hmm. some parts of this and we said well we are prepared to fund things like industry does that will fail we said that for the mm -hmm. first time and some of them did fail but it was interesting because the, the catchment of, 
of applications for these grants was really new for the you know, you get mm -hmm. engineers, you know, mm -hmm. you, you get people who are interested in mass digitization. That was very interesting. We also... Is there, is there anything particularly yeah, important? Yes, so, yes, that? yes. Yes, and we also um, teamed with the Department of Energy to get uh, supercomputer time, and we were very interested in um, getting money to build digital centers. Now, saying all that, you know, the... It's a great source of information, but there's got to be somebody who could make sense of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm all for it, but it's not the end all and, and be all because there's a lot of junk out there. You know, you have to have kind of discernment to uh, to use it. But it is a terrific resource. But I was going to say when I left, we, with all this encouragement, uh, and we were very something very you know, sort of dictatorial. We said, well, we're not going to fund this kind of project unless it's digitized. Uh, only about 5% of all the applications that are going to be done were for digitization. Can't books and track, so. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't know, it's, I mean, part of it is generational. Yes, I'm sure that's right. Know, and I, so I'm not sure exactly where, where they are on that. No, but I thought it was one of the great untapped resources. Now you've been, Gone now from the endowment for uh, almost six, six years six now. Years um, how has it proceeded in your absence? Well, I have to be discreet about this. You know. I think it's had a few bumps. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, and um, that is, uh, I, I think, because I mean, one of the what the chairman really has to do is uh, well. Let's put it this way. How does he, how do you how does the how does the grant process work? Well, the applications come in, and then they're judged by the uh, members of each of these divisions: public programming, uh, scholar, you know, research, and like. And then they are they go to the National Council on Humanities, which is this advisory board, and they come up with no recommendations, but just with kind of a general assessment. And mm -hmm. The National Council on the Humanities makes a recommendation to the chairman, but the chairman is the only one who really has the power to award money. So knowing that, I wanted to have a very strict, under, a very you know good understanding of what these were. So I used to go to all the panels, what happens is the grants are sorted and then there's peer review panels, and these peer review panels make um, you sat in on all of them. I sat in thousands of them. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it was interesting because I, you know, I, I wanted to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. Very Did you first participate step. or just listen? No, I always listen. Only mm -hmm. a couple times I mm -hmm. participated. And things went off course. Mm -hmm. And I thought I needed to say something. That represented the viewpoint mm -hmm. uh, of you know the administration, any uh, uh, administration. And so you you have to be. Yeah, very careful because when you sign those books, all that responsibility is on you. But in a very Washingtonian way, they've got it figured out because all the no letters, the turn down letters, are signed by the divisions. Only the yes letters are signed by the chairman. So, uh, so that I think that's the key. Is there has to be? I think the more successful chairman uh, have exercise really um, a lot of, um, they, must put, they put a lot of time into looking at the quality of the grants and understanding the grant process. And if you don't do that, uh, I think you sort of shirk your responsibility. So you, you, you think there's been some... Slippage? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Some laxity there. Um, after you left the endowment, you went on to run, I think, for about three years, the American Revolution Center. Uh, and, and tell me a little bit about that experience. Well, I left the endowment, I actually had another year on my term, but I left and went to become president and CEO of the American Revolution Center, which was to be the first museum of the American Revolution. I mean, it is uh, astounding that there isn't one. There isn't one. And this had the 
the sort of germ of this was the purchase of a collection uh, from the Reverend Burke, who was late 19th, early 20th century figure, who had begun collecting uh, Revolutionary War objects. And the biggest purchase was Washington's campaign tent. That was in the general collection. And so I thought this was a very good idea, and but it was very complex and sort of contentious because they had first started off before I came trying to establish this thing at Valley Forge National Park. Mm -hmm. And it's it just put it this way, it's very hard to do something like this in under the aegis of a kind of federal bureaucracy. And they left. And they purchased 72. They, they couldn't work with it in national parks. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. too difficult. Too many restrictions, mm -hmm. and, you know, and dominant and hours, and, and and like I mean, they have their rules, you know. If you can, but th those rules conflict mm -hmm. I mean, with the um, kind of more interpret entrepreneurial flexibility, you know, the so private and public sectors. Yeah, they're yeah. exactly right. Exactly. So. This is all about before my time. So they moved on, they bought, I think, 78 acres adjacent to this in Valley Forge. And um, they then had developed a lot of plants. It's undeveloped land. One of the biggest, probably the last parcel of land up there. And they, before it came, they had really involved a lot of plants. They were going to have a museum. Well, they had a museum designed by Robert Stern, mm -hmm. which they kind of moved over, they never built anything, but they, mm -hmm. they readjusted it. I'm a big fan of Stern. They readjusted the plans to the museum. Yeah, yeah. It was basically the same museum, but they mm -hmm. sort of reoriented the museum and new, new site. And then they wanted to build a hotel, sort of conference center. Mm -hmm. and like, anyway, they all ran in a so tremendous thing. Thinking along something along the lines of Mount Vernon, perhaps? Mount Vernon, yeah, exactly. Some kind of mm -hmm. mini Aspen. Gettysburg. Mini Aspen. Mm -hmm. And they ran into a lot of flack. And it was really an interesting experience because they ran into flack in, in a couple of ways. One is that they, that they really ran afoul of the National Parks Conservation Association. I think that's what, it, again, I think that's right. And this is maybe a little too technical, but what that went on was, was an inholding. And an inholding is a piece of land that's almost completely or or almost completely surrounded by mm -hmm. parkland. Mm -hmm. And this is a big issue, not so much in Valley Fort, because there are huge inholdings in the West mm -hmm. that have mineral rights and the like. And so the National Park Conservation Association, which is a you know nonprofit that works with the with the National Park Service, um, the, wanted to make a stand on this. And and they said, well, no, you can't develop this. You know, this is you know, parkland. And also several residents, mm -hmm. you know, not in my backyard, mm -hmm. joined in. And there was a protected, protracted legal battle over mm -hmm. this. It lasted many years. It cost millions of dollars. And the uh, American Revolution Center won every, uh, every court case, including federal court. And then we're in that state when I came in, and I thought, well, I'll probably be able to fix this up because I'll suggest that nothing beyond that site except the museum. And um, I thought that that wouldn't work for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was, I, you know, I think there was some justification in what the National Park. The Conservation Association was sane, and two because when I got up there, I realized that that was the wrong place for it, because a Valley Forge Park was the wrong place for it because um, it's hard to know what their attendance is, but they probably have about a million mm -hmm. visitors. But it's no longer historical visitors. In the old days, it was a pilgrimage site. Mm -hmm. There used to be the Boy Scout Jamboree there, mm -hmm. and people came 
to see Washington's headquarters and, and the cabinet at, at Valley Forge. But in time, with the lessening of interest in American history and the kind of disappearance of some of these figures, even founders, that slacked off. And besides, it's very difficult to get to. You have to take the Skullco, the Skullco uh, Expressway or whatever it's called. That would be the wrong term. Which is a kind of parking lot all the way up there. So I thought this is not going to work. Because even if you could get the building there, even if you could win the court case, um, because the National Parks Conservation Association was going to take this to the Supreme Court. And when you have this a lawsuit hanging over there, you can't really, mm -hmm. you can't really raise any money or make any claims. So what I decided we would do is move down, try to move down to Philadelphia. And that was the natural place for it. And we went down there and looked at a lot of buildings. There were a lot of buildings for sale. But then discovered, through the help of Ed Rendell, who was a big supporter of this, the old visitor center, which is only three blocks from Independence Hall. And that was abandoned because they had the new visitor center right across from Independence Hall. So we did a land swap with the federal government, which took a year, and we swapped land. And, and the 78 acres that we owned went into Valley Forge National Park, where it really belonged. And we got the old visitor center and some cash. And then we did an economic impact study, we did visitor studies, we did a whole series of studies. And uh, which were very, very complicated, like the land, like the land swap. And before I left, we found an architect, Robert Stern, in a competition, very beautiful building, and a designer, uh, exhibition designer. And at that point, I left because that was all fun, but really raising the money, which was about 150 was something that I didn't want to do. Where does that stand now? Well, they've, they've broken ground. I don't know where they are now. I don't know how much money they've actually they've actually raised. But they have they have broken ground. And we'll see what happens. And they're going to build a museum. But is there a timeline? I don't know if there is or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't really kept up with it. But, you know, there are challenges down there because This, they're, they're, that would be the only, um, uh, a four feet, you know, museum down there. And you have the Constitution Center as well, but that's not really a museum. And it's very difficult because you have to make sure that your gate you know, gives you enough money so you can pay for your operating expenses and the like. So, it, you know, it's, it's true with all museums now. You've talked about how our level of history knowledge and comprehension of our past seems to be fading and is affecting various projects. Um, it was one, I guess, of the, uh, this, this recognition was one of the things that stimulated the, the We the People project. Um, what, what, what do you think it says uh, about, you know, it's, it's primarily a responsibility, I would think, of, of our schools and institutions of education to keep this kind of thing alive. Um, what, what, what does that say about the direction in which our, our academic culture has moved? Not good. Uh, well, you know, my, I'm particularly interested in the K through 12 piece, mm -hmm. and I have a little initiative called the History Civics Initiative, which I'm working on, which is going to do a white paper, which will explore K through 12 history and civics education, which is really pretty much neglected. Mm -hmm. I mean, when the NAEP, which is the, you know, the uh, Department of Education, Report card comes out and it says that 53% or around 53% of seniors flunk to history at town. There's always a flurry of you know editorials and like, oh my god, teeth gnashing and wailing, you know, airplane. Uh, but then it goes away. I mean, the real, I think there's been more interest in this in colleges and universities. And we have very good metrics for both colleges and universities, you know, the whole K through 21. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why, why, why is this happening? I 
think there are a number of reasons. One is, you know, teachers are great people, but they think they're being shortchanged by the education schools. Because they get out of education schools with a lot of uh, emphasis on Educational psychology and, and how you run your classroom, a bit of social ju justice mixed in there, and <coughs> with very little limited, in most cases, subject knowledge. And you can't teach what you don't know, and they're handicapped when when they get out. Now, that's one of the big the textbooks are pap, you know, they're just um, done by committee. Playing my K through twelve now, and they're uninteresting to most to most of the kids. And are they politically correct? Yeah, they're all they're well. Let's put it this way. Yeah, they're politically correct, but they're also um, there's a wonderful book by Diane Ravage called Language Police, which he talked about how textbooks get made. I mean, they're all for, really for two markets. That's the um, you know Texas and California markets where and everybody else sort of climbs on them. Um, it's just that, you know, there's a checklist of what you have to do. These are books that are written by committees, um, and they, um, I, I remember listening to Senator Byrd give this talk, and he was, um, he was a big, whatever else he was, he was a big proponent of learning American history, and he, um, talking about his, his history education and he, he didn't I don't think he said he read this book by lamp or kerosene lamp lighted on a hot scrabble floor in a rundown log cabin in West Virginia but he said um, we read Muzzy and we read Muzzy and this was the book and everybody looked at each other and said what is Muzzy? Have you David, David Muzzy yeah. Yes, the biographer of James G. Blaine. I read it. <laughs> well, he did a textbook. Did he? <laughs> and so we ordered this textbook on, on Amazon. And it was, you know, yay thick. Hmm. And I don't think you could give this to a college seeker. And so that, you know, the, the, it, it, it went, it's gone from that to books that are actually built by committee. And they're mainly pictures, you know, lots of, lots of, lots of pictures. And they are politically correct. I mean, you have to have more of this and more of that, you know. And and um, uh, I mean, some of these figures are important. I mean, I always when we were in the endowment, we should tell the whole story, mm -hmm. you know, of American history, not some kind of plaster saint mm -hmm. uh, version of it. And but um, what's happened is that the uh, some of the more important elements, like the founders, for instance, uh, have been pretty much neglected. But you got to give equal time to, to everybody, and some figures are not as important. It's one of the complaints against the new AP standards. Right. They're dropping the, the, most of the founders, and a lot of that what was considered core material. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to understand the founding. I mean, I remember there was this big fight in, I think it was North Carolina, where uh, the, the senior class would study history only, I think, from 1878 onward. And, and this was really in a nerve. I mean, all across the spectrum, left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, really, that's not true because, you know, they're getting it in fourth grade. They're getting it in eighth grade. But you, these are very complicated mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the Federalists and all that. Mm -hmm. And so I, so I think that's... Uh, um, plus, I think there's just, um, you know, a, uh, it's not made interesting. I mean, if you look... And see who's selling the best sellers now. These are all people, for the most part, who um, are not academics. Barbara Tuckman said, who is this great, you know, popular historian, said, you know, what I consider a real blessing was that I don't never got a PhD. So I could I could I could write. And she said that's true of David McCullough as well. Yeah, but yeah. McCullough, I mean, most of those people. Uh, Doris Grimm's Goodwood, mm -hmm. you know, most of those people who are really selling mm -hmm. mega books uh, who, and reaching a huge number of people, I mean, relatively huge, uh, are, um, or, or look at, I mean, even somebody like Bill O'Reilly, you know, 
who sells uh, millions of millions of books. And why is that? Because they could tell a good story. And that, I think, is one of the ingredients, key ingredients in, in history. And that's, that's, not really, that's not really being done. So we did, when I was in the American Revolution Center, we did a, the first survey of American uh, knowledge of, of, of American, of adult and knowledge of American history. And we get Ken Chung did it. It was a really very good um, scientific survey, and it was Americans adult eighteen and above. And there was, there were three findings really. Um, when Americans were asked, adult Americans were asked if they thought American history was important to know, over ninety percent said yes. And then we said, well, what is your knowledge of American history? Give us a grade. And you know, it was probably an average was probably one. Mm-hmm. Then we gave them a test, and eighty-three uh, percent got Fs or Ds. So that there is a there, you know, there's a desire. Somehow there's this abstract idea that you need to know uh, about American history. But this is very threatening because uh, it, you know, you in order to be a good citizen, you need to know your history. You know, Jefferson said something like that. Um, Quote, which is not escaping me. You know, a nation that is ignorant and free is something that never was and never will be. And from the founders, you you know, this idea that you had to know um, your history and your institutions and the like in order to exercise good citizenship. So, are you hopeful we can what what uh, turn things around, or what what advice uh, along those lines might you give to uh, the next chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities? Well, I think that this one of the cores of the endowment should be the promotion of American history and civics, and that's what this federal agency should should be doing. And there are a lot of other interesting and more exotic things, mm-hmm. but that seems to me what you're doing is dealing with taxpayers' money, and I think like you want to promote things like the comprehensive internet, the lexicon, the sumerian, mm-hmm. the dictionary. You want to make what the endowment does impactful. And I don't think there's anything more important than the idea that the endowment should be trying to step in and um, fill, try to help fill this gap. Uh, in, in, in the, but the thing about it is the endowment is such a small player in all this. No matter what anybody says, they have a budget of $150 million. Well, if you look at the money that is given for scholarship, in you know in, outside of the endowment, it's in the billions. I mean, it's it's every university, it's every museum, it's all private. So the endowment can only uh, do so much. But I, I think it is a good, very good bully pulpit. And so mm-hmm. that's that's what I that's what I try to do, and I think that's a vital factor. And I think the chairman who have been most successful have, have really realized that. That is, I mean, you look at the legislation, that is part of what the endowment should be doing. Well, I don't think there are many chairmen more successful than yourself. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for spending time with us.